What's going on, team? Hope you're having a wonderful morning so far. So I have a special guest on here, and I'm super excited for y'all to hear from him. Um, because I mean, we we met through a mutual friend at, at an archery camp, and she told me she's like, "You have to talk to this dude." So. Hence our, our uh, conversation and then which ultimately led to this meeting. And so I'm excited for all the information y'all are going to get from him. And I mean, selfishly, I'm going to learn a lot too and implement into the training. So yeah. So Dr. Rob, how's it going? Good. How are you, Kim? Fine and dandy. I'm really excited for you to come on. So thank you so much for making the time to share your knowledge with us. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm excited. It's not something that uh, is talked about a lot here in the United States, especially just it's a little taboo, but i um, excited to talk about it and give, give out good information. Sweet. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's start off of uh, who are you? How did you get into uh, hunting? Cause you're an avid outdoorsman. All right. So how did you get into hunting uh, physical therapy? So the hunting, uh, we'll start with that one first. Hunting, I grew didn't grow up hunting. Uh, my dad was born in Columbus, Ohio. He was a city guy. Um, we moved to Wisconsin. My mom's parents live in Wisconsin, so that's what brought us there. And uh, my grandparents don't hunt. In fact, they threaten to uh, spray us with cologne every time that we get ready to go out and go hunt. Um, the jokingly, of course. And buddies like at home that that's what you do in Wisconsin is you hunt. It's kind of like Wyoming here uh, where I'm at right now. Um, if you don't hunt, you're probably in the minority in Northern Wisconsin, just because that's just what you do. And um, so friends in grade school and all that in middle school would always get out and go hunting. Um, so I kept nagging my dad to do it. So uh, we, he ran into some, some now family friends that were like, yeah, we'll, we'll take you hunting on our place. So um, my dad would go and then I would tag along for gun season. And that's kind of what started my passion for hunting was back in Wisconsin for whitetails. Um, and then I started traveling for as a uh, physical therapist. Once I graduated, got into Western hunting, actually out in California of all places where the hunting is not excellent. Um, but I cut my teeth on backpack hunting out there specifically and um, a buddy was he backpacked he did all some all kinds of crazy stuff and so he got me he he taught me the backpacking side I kind of taught him the hunting side but it wasn't really that much because it's western hunting and I had never done it before um, but we have continued to hunt since then and um, I shot a bear in California in 2020 and then um, that's been it for western hunting I've been elk hunting twice in Colorado during the rut and last year we had multiple bulls but two or two bulls under 40 yards and another bull at 50 or 60 yards I didn't see them I was the caller so ah. I, I didn't really get a chance to see them um, but we're going back this year and uh, we're super stoked so that got me into western hunting um as far as physical therapy goes, I had some back issues when I was a sophomore in high school and my athletic trainer who actually I'm going to do, uh, he reached out to me through a Facebook group because he saw a response that I gave about elk hunting in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And so he reached out to me. He's like, Hey, I'm thinking about doing a scouting trip to Colorado. Do you mind if we talk on the phone a little bit? I saw that you mentioned that you've hunted in Colorado. I was like, yeah, sure. That's cool. He's actually the one that got me into physical therapy. Um, he gave me some exercises to do my sophomore year uh, with my back and in about, in about four weeks, my pain was gone. I was back to lifting weights. So that was pretty cool. Um, fast forward eight years later, seven years later, um, graduating with my doctorate and then picked up travel PT. So I've traveled and worked coast to coast. Um, wilderness PT started because I had a very crummy experience. 2020 was actually the hunt that I killed my bear on the pack in trip was miserable. Um, it was eight miles and did not sleep all the night before because we slept in the car. We got to the trailhead at four o'clock in the morning, 3.30 in the morning. We drove from five o'clock the night before. My food wasn't delivered, so I had to get new food. It was just a nightmare of a trip. So nutrition and sleep were not, um, not on my side. And so I cramped. I started cramping a third of the way through the hike. And so it led to a very atrocious experience. And I was like, I know what I'm doing. I can't imagine folks who don't know like the human body and what they're 
training or what they should be doing for training. Um, I can't imagine what that's like. So then that's what started Wilderness PT. Um, and then the pelvic floor component of Wilderness PT was something totally, I never expected to do this, but as a therapist in some outpatient clinics throughout the United States, I, I was working with some women that they were having some low back pain um, issues. And I was still in the kitchen sink at them. Nothing was getting better. And I didn't know the pelvic floor. Like I didn't know how to go about that. And I've also worked with a few women who were pregnant. Um, and I didn't feel super confident in my exercise prescription with them because I didn't know. It's something that we touch on briefly in class, but it's it's definitely a special specialization once you get outside in the into the uh, professional realm. So I took a course on that because I didn't want to not be able to help someone else who came onto my caseload. Um, <clears throat> wilderness, wilderness PT had already been a thing at that point, but I took this class. Um, it was an eight week course. And every week it was like, I was back in school. There was so much knowledge that like, was being dropped. I was like, this is mind blowing. I didn't know. Like it, it, they make it seem so simple, but for someone who's never really dove down that, route. Um, it was, it was like I was back in school each week. So it was super cool. Um, three weeks into the program or into the course, I had a 20 year old girl show up, uh, on my caseload. She had been dealing with low back issues for, since she was an eighth grader. Um, and she, uh, going into the exam more, cause I get paid to ask questions. Like your insurance company is paying me to ask questions. And so I just drill people with questions and I'm sure they get sick of it. But if I don't dive deeper, the jet like I'm not going to do a good job. Um, so the more questions I asked, the more that we uncovered. And she had recently seen a pelvic floor physical therapist. Saw him for saw that therapist for three visits, and that was it. They did an internal exam and said that she's got tension in her pelvic floor. Gave her some relaxation exercises, and that was about it. It's like, okay, did you get? She's like, yeah, I kind of felt better, but not really. Um, so dove down the pelvic floor route with her. I don't do internal exams at all. I will never do that. That's more <laughs> PT I'm not going to get into. Um, and you can be, or I can be very successful with, with my questions and figuring out what's going on with my question asking um, to figure out what's going on and then treat from there. So we started um, with Kegels and they were power Kegels. And, um, because there is a difference and did that. I saw her, I think it was once a week that I was seeing her because she was still going to school and all that. Um, so she was busy, but she was like peeing her pants during class when she'd cough, laugh or sneeze. Um, she would, she had, didn't really, she had pain when she would go to the bathroom. It, she couldn't work out anymore. She used to love lifting weights and all that, but she hadn't done it for years because she would just pee her pants. And so did the power Kegel thing, address some um, glute weakness, but uh, she had seen sports physical therapists. She had seen chiropractors. She had seen multiple doctors. She had seen a ton of providers before she had seen me and she, um, came back and she's like, actually like things started to change a little bit. Um, I'm able to control it a little bit better. And then she, um, we progressed a little bit more with the, with the pelvic floor control and in four sessions, she was good to go. Like was not peeing her pants, did not have pain when she would pee, was able to control it when she was started lifting weights. Um, and on the fifth session, I ran her through a workout with hopping and all this other stuff with impact. And she's like, yeah, I'm dry. I was like, all right. She's like, I was like, do you need me? No, perfect, get out of here. So after that, I was hooked. I was like, this is, that was incredible. Um, just to see that transformation. Um, because selfishly, like as a therapist, you, I, I went into this field to help people. And when you're successful, like you feel good. I'm happy for them. I'm not happy because like, I'm, my head is the size of a freaking watermelon. I can't feel, fit through the door because my ego is so big. It's not that it's like get seeing the change in their eyes and seeing the, like the, the light click on like, Oh, okay. I can do all this stuff. Whether it's public for other things. Um, that's what I do it for is to help people realize that they, they can do a lot more than what they think they can. Yeah, that's, that's freaking cool. Like, that's just a cool story. And uh, I mean, I know that you've, you've told me that story before, like on our first meeting, but even still, I'm just like, I, 
I could not imagine just that feeling of, of that 20 year old girl, right. Of like, wow. Okay. I can, I can jump rope and I don't, and I don't pee my pants. Like that is life changing. That's really cool. Yeah. And I celebrate, I'm like a freaking high school uh, athlete that just scored a touchdown, like his first touchdown on the varsity team. Like, I, like I've celebrated, like, like I've taken Theraband, like they've been doing something and I've had Theraband in my hands and I'll, I'll like scream and throw it down. I was oh, sorry. Like I'm, I'm just <laughs> for you. And they're like, what the hell is wrong with you? Um, but I just get pumped up for him. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, uh, that's cool. Like it's, it's just so cool. And hearing from a, from a medical professional, right. Of, you are genuinely excited will freaking celebrate on somebody else's i guess um uh, accomplishment in their own health like i i wish there were more more professionals like you like in it for the right reason right because yeah. there's a lot of them who aren't <laughs> man and that just gets to be a long day like there's a group it's actually the group that i took the pelvic floor course through i've taken four courses with them and i like I have zero issues spending the kind of money on my CEUs that I do with that group because of the quality of the content and just like how they are presenting PT. Cause a lot of people think PT like their bands and all this other stuff, like they're pretty low level stuff, but that's not what PT is. Like we can take people to a very high level and we can train or we, yeah, we can train and help very high level athletes. It like, my days are long. I mean, I hear people talk about how they hurt and what's wrong with them for anywhere from six to 10, 12 hours a day. Like it is a long day, but what is e an even longer day is your patient's not getting better. Right. And like, there's just no way I could do that again. Selfishly, there's no way that I can go through my job without my patients getting better. Cause that day is very long and that's not a day that I want to really encounter. There are going to be people that you can't help. We can't help everybody. Um, but if hearing the success story is just, it's kind of like golf. Like you get that one shot and it's like, all right, I can keep golfing again for another round, but obviously it, it's more than one shot. Like I, I like to see a lot of my patients getting better. I like to see all of them getting better, but it doesn't, it makes a day more, um, more fun when people are coming in like, yeah, like I, I'm doing a lot better. So. Yeah. 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 That's, that's really cool. Yeah. And I mean, even uh, coming from, you know, a strength, right. So a strength background, I mean, that's, uh, that's how I feel about my clients too. Um, my, my goal is to, uh, give my clients enough knowledge to where they don't need me that they want to continue to work with me. Right. So that give them everything that I got and like, okay, you, yeah. So you no longer need me, but I want you to want me because that's how I pay my bills. But you know, it's a, it's a really cool yeah feeling whenever they're like, no, like I have this self-confidence. I have this empowerment to do whatever I want to do and not have to worry about strength or peeing my pants or doing anything else. Yeah. And that's like giving people the knowledge. Those are the ones that get better. Like people will get better if you just tell them what to do and they do it. Um, there are people that will get better with that, but the ones that are seeking out the knowledge that want to know, um, those are the ones that are going to get better and then stay better. Those aren't going to be your repeat clients. Those are going to be the ones that or if they are a repeat client, it's not coming in for the same thing. That mm -hmm. bugs me. And I'm not in one spot long enough because I'm still traveling full time. So I'm not in one spot long enough to see people come back for the same thing, which is probably a blessing. <laughs> Cause yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, I'd probably um give them the right act a little bit. Like, what are you doing? You knew what to do. Um uh -huh. Yeah, giving them the knowledge and giving them the the empowerment, like what you said. That's part of my tagline, like educate and empower. That's that's what it is. That's what I like to do. I don't want people to rely on me to fix them. I hate that. Um, mm -hmm. I want them to rely on themselves to fix themselves. I just happen to be the coach that's going to give you some tips along the way. Yes. Yes, exactly. And okay. So just kind of shifting. So you are a, an online or a traveling physical therapist. Yes. I travel full time. Yes, I am. My wilderness PT is all online, so okay. everything I do is online. With that, um, <clears throat> it's nice. The flexibility is 
is nice and I can reach more people being online. So yeah, well, let me, like if you're seeing me outside of my travel contract, you are seeing me online. And so how, like, how does that work? How does online PT work? Um, it, a lot of education, um, teaching them how to move. Uh, I also use a, an app on form is what I use. I'm still building out the exercise library in that because I just switched to that uh, the, earlier this year, but um, teaching them how to move and then they send back videos of themselves and then I can analyze the video and give cues based off of that. Um, and then with the lab, with the exercise library, like I do voiceovers and give little cues on what to look for with each movement that I, that I coach or that I give them to do. Nice. So, uh, <clears throat> it's a lot of video analysis, um, with the women's health course, like there is some of that. The primary focus is obviously bladder control. So you can't really see those muscles contract a whole lot, nor mm -hmm. do they move a whole lot. So you're not, there's not a whole lot of video analysis there. Um, but if they're deadlifting, I mean, they will be deadlifting, um, when they're squatting, when they're doing other movements, um, I just say like, if, if you want video analysis on what you're doing or how you're moving here, send over videos, like front view, side view. So that way I can give you feedback. Cool. That's awesome. Like yep. I, I love online. Yeah. It's, it's super convenient and it, again, it places empowerment and places the control in the client's hands or the patient's hands. Um, which to take ownership of their health, which is honestly what needs to happen. Doctors, medical providers, um, everybody is extremely busy with the demand, the increasing demand um, for our United States population. Like as a whole, we're getting unhealthier, which is terrible. Like we have some super high level athletes, but we have the lowest of the low as far as health goes. So um, the online just allows, again, for greater outreach, uh, but it also places health into their own hands, which is ultimately what needs to happen. You can't rely on anybody to come fix you. Like you need to take care of yourself. Um, physical therapists, chiropractors, personal trainers, medical doctors, uh, everybody is here to hopefully assist, just assist you along the way versus um, slapping a Band-Aid on a uh, the the water tank hole i'm that picture like a pic you know what i'm talking about yeah because um, that's what sometimes happens is that people are bit the that your primary care doctor or your uh, orthopedic doctor whoever is is smoking busy and they're like well take this pill well there's a lot of education that could go into that person before they take that pill um mm -hmm. so yeah it's just yeah I have the time to educate about nutrition, about sleep. Sleep is a huge one. I, uh, yeah, sleep is a whole rabbit hole. Yeah. But, uh, it's, <clears throat> if you're not getting at least six, your injury risk goes up um, exponentially. Um, your ability to lose weight becomes more difficult. Not that it's impossible, mm -hmm. but it becomes much more difficult just because of hormone release and all that. Um your performance definitely goes down, especially if you're in the mountains, just because the elevation is going to inherently reduce your, your ability to exert yourself. But then if you're getting less than six hours of sleep, your time to physical exhaustion goes down by another 15 to 20, 25%. So um, sleep is sleep is huge, but it's not talked about enough. Yeah, I 100% agree with everything that you just said, right? So I mean, yeah. People need to take their, their health, like their health is their responsibility. And I mean, yeah, the, something needs to change. And if it doesn't, well, you're just putting lipstick on a pig. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, like I had someone, one of my clients from last night, um, she finally, like she has one more session left with the program and two, two weeks ago, we're meeting every other week at this point now, just to um, span them out a little bit. <clears throat> and she had a lot going on in her personal life that kind of just blew up. And she's finally gotten like the sleep, the nutrition, all that stuff. And she started to lose weight and all that. And she's like, that's basically all I'll do. Like I, like I'll get up, I'll go to the gym. Then I come back to work and I or go to work and then I come back and hang out for a little bit. I might meal prep for the next day. And then like, it's time to go to sleep. And there's not a whole lot of time for 
like day i was like yeah that's i mean that's what the week <laughs> is unless you escape the rat race that's what your week should be um you're gonna have diy projects but you might not have a ton of time to do them during the week save that for the weekends mm -hmm. um but get your sleep so that way you're fresh for the weekend so that way you can function better get the diy project done and then go on to something fun or just push the diy project on, like home projects off a little bit i I don't know. I like I rent, so I don't have to do home home repair. But um, it, yeah, you have to make your health a priority. Otherwise, no one's going to do it for you. Otherwise, yeah. you're going to have like if you don't make your health a priority, you're going to end up in a hospital bed with mm -hmm. a team of physicians, therapists, and dietitians, social work, everybody around you trying to help you out. Um, but you don't want to get to that point. Yep. Yep. Exactly. I mean. Yeah, the I I think training training and nutrition and, and focusing on your sleep. Right, so I I coach the big like the big five. Right, so track your food, hit your protein, move your body, drink your water, prioritize your sleep. Those five things, and it's it's so funny. It's simple, but simple doesn't mean easy, right? And you can take those preventative measures and live such a completely different life. Um, yeah, it's just, it's crazy. Just those, those simple things day in and day out. Yeah. It's boring. Boring isn't sexy. Right. But boring works. Yeah. Consistency, consistency works. It does not have to be fancy and fancy usually kills compliance. Yes. Not, now, if you have time or you, like you have someone else at home where every other night or every two nights, like you're making a nice meal. Yeah. Go for it. You don't have to eat mm -hmm. chicken ice. Like you can have some very nice, good tasting meals. It doesn't, your nutrition doesn't have to be boring, but the general outline is, can be boring and monotonous, but that's where you see results. Yep. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I'm glad that you said that. Cause I feel like my clients hear me say that all the freaking time. And so having another voice say that too, it's reassuring. Yeah. I mean, I work backwards. My sleep is my sleep is the priority. Like I have my bedtime set. Um, and then I work backwards from that as far as like things that I can get done after work, things that I do after work. Uh, and then in the morning, like my, the morning is my time. I'll do some content creation in the morning. Um, and then my workouts are in the morning and then after work is kind of a free for all as far as figuring out what I, when I need to get done, like dishes, I don't know, vacuum, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's all reserved after work because I can't yep. work out. So just, yeah, be consistent with what you do. Exactly. Exactly. Well, you ready to answer some questions? <laughs> we got some good ones. Yeah, <laughs> we do have some good yeah. ones. Um, all right. So the first one, so, uh, someone told me that clenching your jaw is the same thing as doing a Kegel. Is that true? I have a feeling that there's some context that I'm missing with this one, yeah. but it's not like just taking it for what it is. No, that is not true. Um, clenching your jaw. I don't know if they're saying that clench when you clench your jaw, you, you draw in your pelvic floor, like you do a Kegel. Um, that is not the case. Like you can clench your jaw and not really clench anything else in your body. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it's like someone after a knee replacement or someone after an ACL reconstruction, when you're doing therapy, you should be able to do a quad set. That's where your leg is out straight and you just tighten your quads to straighten out your knee and you see your quad fire. You should be able to do that without co-contracting your hamstrings or your glutes. So you should be able to isolate different muscles um, throughout the body. Your brain should have that ability. So doing a Kegel is the same thing. You have two layers of the pelvic floor. Um, the deep layer is the layer that's responsible for it. This is kind of answering a question later on, um, I think. Um, but uh, the deep layer is the layer that's responsible for controlling your bowel and bladder function. So you should be able to do a Kegel without without contracting your glutes, without contracting your um, your groin muscles at all. So that's, for face value, that's not true. <laughs> okay, there you go. Um, but if you more context of that, let me know, and I, I would be happy to go dive, or dive, dive deeper into that answer. I mean, I, I kind of assumed like it was kind of a, a comparison of like, oh, like a Kegel is like clenching your jaw. So that's, that's kind of where I... I assumed the question was going, which is what you answered. Um, but kind of a, a second, like 
section A, right, to to that question. Do you want to explain what a Kegel is and then a power Kegel? I've never heard of a power Kegel. So when we're born, like your brain, nervous system, and muscles all communicate and the reflexes and all that stuff, it's there. Before there's trauma to the pelvic floor, um, whether it's birthing or uh, birthing, being pregnant, being pregnant is trauma to the pelvic floor. So you don't even have to give birth. Um, like if you have a miscarriage later, later in a pregnancy, there's still trauma to the pelvic floor um, or any other kind of trauma to the pelvic floor. Um, the reflex that your brain and nervous system and muscles have developed with that Kegel um, ha- is is gone for some women. Um, the, that communication just isn't there. So you have to reteach your brain how to do that. So a Kegel, um, you don't have to do this, but for anybody listening to the recording, um, take a rolled up towel, sit on it, sit right on top of it and uh, do what you think is a Kegel. Are you pushing into it or are you pulling away from it? Um, those are the two cues that I give. If you're pushing into it, you're more bearing down. You're not actually contracting those muscles. You're actually increasing quite a bit of uh, pressure within the pelvic floor. Um, you should be drawing up and away. The cue that I give is pretend you're doing, pre- pretend you're slurp or drinking a smoothie through a straw through your vagina. And that's what you should be doing for a Kegel. Yeah. Um, now a power Kegel is a very hard contraction. And then you hold for five seconds. Like I'll have patients hold for five seconds and then they completely relax. And then I'll have them do that again, a very hard squeeze of the pelvic floor and then completely relax. Um, Sometimes women, they don't know, they think their pelvic floor is relaxed, but it actually is not. And that power Kegel gives some, um, can give some feedback as to whether or not that public, whether or not you're actually relaxing the public floor, because you're really going to contract hard. And then when you do relax, you might find that you were actually, you had quite a bit of underlying tension. Um, and then there's like an endurance Kegel, which is a bunch of quick flicks. Um, you do like one set of 30 or two sets of 50 or something like that. And that can help train that reflex. Like when you jog, um, again, before any sort of trauma happened to the pelvic floor, when you jog, your pelvic floor would contract, like ref- just before your heel would hit your pelvic floor would contract. So that way you wouldn't pee your pants. So that quick flick Kegel, um, is a, is a good way to help retrain that. Nice. Okay. Yep. Have never heard of like subsets of Kegels, right? So that, that was interesting. And you can take those into different positions too, right? Like doing a Kegel on your back with your knees bent, that's probably going to be the easiest way um, because you're not going against gravity. And then you can sit up and sitting on a firm surface. Like if you're going to do that towel exercise, make sure you're sitting on a firm surface. I can't remember if I said that or not, but you want to make sure that you're sitting on a firm surface. So that way you get that feedback um, into the pelvic floor. But um, going to like a half kneeling position uh, where you're you're, like, you're in the proposing position. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, And because you can do shoulder press in that position. Well, when you do shoulder press, that's a downward pressure. That's going to create more pressure on your pelvic floor. So you need to be able to do a Kegel so that way you don't pee your pants when you do a shoulder press. Um, But, and then taking it to standing and then adding in some impact training. Like it's, it's not just the Kegel on your back. It is a Kegel with daily life and with exercise uh, it's just retraining your brain to when to contract it nice okay that's a that's a really good cue too because i i i guess i never really thought of a kegel in different positions right Mm -hmm. it was always like standing or sitting but never really thought of oh kneeling position or you know just yeah different positions so Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Again, <laughs> that class was incredible. Like I learned a lot in that class. So yeah. I the more you know. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so second one. So speaking of uh, trauma to the pelvic floor, what advice would you give a mom that just gave birth? Uh, my first bullet point. Um be weird and go against the norms. So it is common and perceived as normal that once you're a mom, you're going to pee your pants. It's not like that does not have to be it. Uh, You can go. It doesn't matter if you 
uh, had your kid three months ago, if you had your kid 30 years ago, your pelvic floor is a muscle group that can be trained. Um, just like glutes, quads, hamstrings, you can train your pelvic floor um, to, to be strong again. So be weird, go against the norms as far as you're not going to tolerate peeing your pants for the rest of your life just because you just had a kid. Um, the exercise, you're generally cleared for exercise around six weeks. Uh, that's going to come from your OB though. That can't come from a PT, but in general, you're cleared for exercise within or at six weeks. Um, C-section, it might be six to eight weeks. Again, that's just got to come from your OB. Um, but uh, generally vaginal delivery is a little more traumatic. It is more traumatic for the pelvic floor, but they can return to exercise generally a little bit quicker. Whereas with a C-section, they, um, the, the incision has to heal. So they're going to be a little more conservative with that return to exercise component. Okay. And I mean, the, I don't know if this is getting too specific, but that does that also include like with tearing of the vagina? through vaginal birth? Yes. So that, again, that's got to come from the OB. Um, if there's going to be any sort of ins like suturing or incision or yeah, suturing or um, repair, that's probably going to extend it out a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'll be honest with you. I don't know timelines for that. Um, what, what to expect if it's, if they treat it just like a, a muscle tear, cause that's what it is. It's skin and muscle tearing. Um, if they treat it like that, um, typical or norm, I would say normal birthing age is what, 20 to 35. Um, yeah. so at that age range, you're looking at six to eight weeks or so for the, for the tissues to heal. Um, so I would imagine that you're, they're going to be around that same, um, six week mark, but again, that's just got to come from the OB. Yeah. Okay. So there you go. Um, um Another, so for another, for a mom that just gave birth, another piece of advice is have realistic expectations, uh, kind of skipping around here, but having realistic, realistic expectations. What was your fitness like before pregnancy? What was your fitness like during pregnancy? Um, the higher your fitness was before pregnancy and the longer you were able to maintain your fitness during pregnancy, the quicker you will return. Um, but Again, trauma is trauma to the pelvic floor. Um, I use the analogy like you got shot with a gun. Like th that's trauma, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you don't see the blood, the uh, like the bullet hole and all the like muscle tearing and all that stuff and all the, and sh the scarring from a bullet um, on your pelvic floor, but it's still trauma. So be patient with yourself. Your body has to relearn a lot of different things in what you're wanting it to be a short amount of time. So um, having those realistic expectations and work with um, work with a physical therapist. It doesn't even have to be like if you're someone that does not like online, that's fine. Not everybody's wants to do online mm -hmm. uh, coaching. So work with a physical therapist. Reach out to me because there is a group that where I took or the, the group that I took the course with, there's a section where I can search for public floor th physical therapists and help them find someone in their area. Um, because not all public floor PTs are trained the same. Um, mm -hmm. These guys are definitely a fitness forward um, continuing education group. They really promote the fitness side of things. So um, if you like what I'm talking about, but you don't like online, that's fine. I will help you find someone that does in-person stuff too. Um, and then the last piece, the return to sex advice, something that again, don't really talk about, but, mm -hmm. uh, usually that's around six weeks unless there's a traumatic that that would again, come from the OB. The OB, OB is probably going to give you some timeline of timeline advice there, but more often than not, I guess, like you're going to go through changes, your vagina, everything down there is going to go through changes. Like you just had a kid. Yeah. Um, whether you had a vaginal delivery or not. So I don't have kids. I've never been down that route at all. So um, what, what we talked about in the class though, is like start with doing things yourself and just learning what it's like down there yourself and then slowly introducing um, sex with your partner. Because mm -hmm. like, if you immediately go for it, it's probably not going to go well. It might, but it's probably not going to go well. <laughs> 
because like your brand, like you, you haven't had kids before or give uh, this, I don't know if they're a new mom or not, but haven't had kids before. Um, or if you have like every, every birth is different. Mm -hmm. So things are going to be different down there. So you knowing, um, what, it, what's going on down there first before your partner or before you start interacting with your partner, um, just, I think that makes women a little bit more comfortable. Um, and if you're not comfortable with sex, like that's, it's just not going to be fun for anybody. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, that's yeah. It won't be fun. <laughs> oh, yeah the return to sex usually around six weeks start with doing things yourself um, exploring yourself and then start to introduce um, maybe some other things and then your partner too there you go okay well, well we like happy marriages <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not married myself but uh yeah that's just that would be my advice okay so kind of going into the fitness side of it, right? So appropriate exercises for expecting mothers. This is an excellent question. Uh, all exercise is appropriate for moms. Um, there was always this notion that you should not exercise on your back after the first trimester. That's been debunked. It just depends on if you're experiencing symptoms or not. Like, are you having pain? Are you having any sort of cardiac or respiratory symptoms with that? Um, if you are, then exercising on your back is not suggested, but if you're not, you can continue to do it or you can modify those positions. Instead, like if you're doing glute bridges on your back, instead of being completely flat on your back, elevate the head, um, elevate your torso a little bit, right? Um, so there's there are ways to modify movements and that's just going to depend on the mom. It's going to depend on their pregnancy. Uh, it, it depends on their fitness level. Um, but all exercise is safe and appropriate for pregnant moms. It is just very case specific. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Impact training, totally fine. Like there are women that do CrossFit all the way up until they give birth. A friend of mine, a friend of mine, what she wasn't doing CrossFit, but she was exercising and lifting weights pretty much up until the time she gave birth. And she had to go in for an emergency C-section because they were selling her house and they were buying a new house. And they, all, they think that the stress and all that stuff led to a premature birth. <laughs> oh gosh. I could not imagine doing all of that. And then yeah, being pregnant close to term. Ah, yeah. No, no it did not sound fun. Um, but yeah, there's no, uh, position. I mean, there are position concerns, but again, working with, um, a coach, is important so that way you can communicate what's going on so that way you're not trying to navigate that stuff in the dark yeah yeah it's a, nothing well i i lost my analogy never mind <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay so a more specific question regarding exercise does squatting teach the peritoneum to strengthen and not relax so if I were to use a squat to birth, would it be harder to have the baby because the body thinks I'm just working out and wouldn't relax? No, squatting will not do that. No movement will teach your brain <clears throat> to contract. Your brain doesn't develop associations with like your bed. Your bed should be going back to sleep. Your, sh your bed should be for sex and uh, sleep. That's it. The two S's. It shouldn't be for anything else. Um, so your brain does develop associations with like certain rooms or certain environments, certain situations. But as far as um, muscle contraction goes, no, you can teach, like you can teach hundred percent of people have pelvic floor. So you can teach anyone to contract and relax their pelvic floor in the bottom of a squat. In fact, if you can do that, you have very good control of your pelvic floor with squatting. Um, squatting is a very good motion. It's not going to, make it any more difficult for you to um, give birth because it's going to make your peritoneum or your pelvic floor have more tension in it. That's not the case. Um, if you, yeah, like I said, if you can get in, get into the bottom of a squat and contract and relax your pelvic floor, you have like, you have the ability to relax it because you're not contracting it. So that, yeah, you would be just fine to squat. Okay. There you go. Um, uh... Can hip pain be caused by pelvic floor weakness? Absolutely. Yeah. I'd actually just evaluate someone today who's, who has 
right hip pain has been having it for years, um, started asking questions and has significant pelvic floor involvement, has low back pain, a ton of things going on. Uh, and it all started with hip pain, right hip pain. Um, the right hip pain did not cause the pelvic floor and the low back pain, but it's all connected. So if you're having hip pain, if if a woman comes into, into the clinic or um, I'm seeing them online and they're having hip pain, I'm thinking like I'm going to do some pelvic floor screening questions. I'm going to do take a look at their back because hip pain can definitely come from their back. Um, the pelvic floor can refer out to the hip a little bit, but chances are it's likely a structure in the hip, but the pelvic floor, there's some sort of uh, complication going on with the pelvic floor too. So yes, it, it can be caused by pelvic floor weakness. Um, but if not, it's likely, there's likely a component to it. Okay. And so you, you had mentioned that, you know, the right hip pain, right? So does the pelvic floor show up in e like either side or is it typically like one side of the other? It could be either side. Yeah. It's not, <clears throat> It's not like the heart where you're, it's going to refer to your left jaw, your left shoulder and down your left arm. Um, it's like it, if it, cause you have left and right muscles and there, I'll admit, I don't know all the muscles. Like there are a lot of muscles down there that control bladder and bowel function. So, and I, I don't know all the names of them, um, but there's a left and right side of them. So they like the left ones can refer down the left leg. The right ones can refer a little bit to the right hip. Yeah. Um, but definitely, it, like if it's not the cause of your right hip pain, it definitely um, is something that I, I, me myself, I would take a look at to see if there's involvement with the pelvic floor. Okay, and uh, so I guess piggybacking off of that, how would you work with a muscular imbalance from left to right? So, are they talking pelvic floor here, or just like in general? I I would assume pelvic floor. It's very hard to isolate. It's not like your quad. Um, where you can contract your right quad and keep your left quad relaxed. It's kind of like your abdominals. <clears throat> like if you scrunch forward, you're contracting rectus abdominis, you're contracting obliques, you're contracting TA. You can't really isolate one versus the other because um, one side has to stabilize while the other one might be moving more, right? Um, if you're twisting or anything. But with the pelvic floor, um, you can't really work with the imbalance from left to right what you can do like the core there there is likely an imbalance um the core it, it's considered a canister so you have your diaphragm that's the top of the core canister then you have your abdominals on the front you have the small little muscles uh, the small little spinal stabilizers on your in your spine and then your pelvic floor is the bottom of the canister again 100 percent of people have a pelvic floor it's not just women mm -hmm. uh, so addressing that uh, cause again, the pelvic floor is usually the last, like we don't address it. Uh, it's just not something that tends to be looked at a lot. We're looking at low back, um, muscles. We're looking at the abs. Um, so that muscular imbalance would be something to address would be the lack of pelvic floor, um, isolation stuff. Okay. Did that, did that answer the question you think? I think so. Yeah. I mean, it, it made sense to me. I was following along with it. Um, and I'm glad, I'm glad that you said that everybody has a pelvic floor. Like it's not just a woman thing. Like men have pelvic floor too. Um, which I feel like not, not that many people talk about I'm like, oh yeah, women, pelvic floor. Okay. Got it. No dudes, you, you have them too. Yep. Yep. Yeah. A hundred percent of humans have pelvic floor. I mean, dogs have a pelvic floor, deer, elk, they all have, we all have pelvic floor. <laughs> yeah it, it's a muscle group um so it's especially if you're a mom um you've gone through some sort of trauma so that needs to be it's just like if you strain your quad right or you tear your acl mm -hmm. you sprain your bicep or strain your bicep like you need to go re through rehab for it it's just not very common for that to happen yet but it will be i think in another five or ten years um the newer OBs are going to be coming out with a therapy mindset. Like if you have a kid, it honestly should be an automatic referral. Like someone after an ACL reconstruction, it's an automatic referral to PT. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's going to get to the point where um, moms, once you have a kid, it's going to be an automatic referral to PT. Yeah, that would be awesome. 
Yeah. All right. Last and final question. Weak muscles that allow for urination leakage. So, um, like I said earlier, I don't know the names of all the muscles, but there are two layers. Um, the first layer is closest to the skin. The deep layer is the muscle is the muscle layer that's responsible for bowel and bladder leakage. Um, that you just need to train it. I say just need to train it, making it sound easy. Um, you need to train it to be strong in a bunch of different positions and with a bunch of different loads. Um, even women, I'm guessing your Facebook group is full of women who are active and working out. Um, so that's not necessarily an issue as far as the active lifestyle goes, but even women who don't want to exercise and be super fit, you don't have to, but you will benefit from loading your pelvic floor with resistance training because there's nothing like a resistance training program, whether, I mean, there's a difference between traditional resistance training and CrossFit training. There's definitely a difference. Um, both are very beneficial, um, but both provide different stimulus to, to our, to our body. So even if you're not someone who wants to be super fit, you're just like, I just want to be a mom being a mom. You have to be athletic to be a mom. Like yes, <laughs> if you have a care, a baby carrier, like your stroller, and you're on a parked on a hill and you're talking to someone else who come up, who came up and like a neighbor or something, you, you, you guys start shooting the shit. And also the baby stroller starts rolling down the hill or rolls down the driveway out into the street. Like you have to be athletic enough to go get your kid before it rolls out into the middle of traffic. Right. It's, there's going to be some power development. There's going to be some strength and there's going to be some fast, fast twitch um, muscle activity. Like you need to be ready for that. Um, so the pelvic floor is very similar in that you, if you overtrain it with your exercise program, again, it doesn't have to be crazy, but if you overtrain it with your exercise program, um, life becomes a lot easier. You can jump down from the bleachers without peeing your pants after your kid's volleyball game. You can um, jump on the trampoline. I just had two clients um, got a hold of me earlier this summer, sent a video of them jumping on a trampoline. And they're like, we just, they completed a last goal. Mind you, they had graduated last October. Like they were done with the program last October. Things have totally changed the program since then, but they graduated last October. They sent me a video. I think it was in April or May and said that they just completed the last goal with, of jumping on a trampoline with their kids and without peeing their pants. So it's not just, um, and one works out pretty consistently. The other one does not. Um, but she learned what she needed to do in order to make her life with her kids um, a lot easier. So it's not just, yeah, being a, being an athlete in the gym, it's it, like, it's for life. Yeah. And I, I tell all of the, all the expecting moms that I work with, I was like, birthing will be your most athletic event of your life. Like it will. And there's so much that's going on with the process of birthing. Like I've, I've never been pregnant. I've never birthed, um, birthed the kid, but my sisters have, and the stories that they tell me, I'm like, huh, no, thanks. <laughs> but, um, you know, that, that is going to be the most athletic event of your life. So why wouldn't you train for it? Yeah. I mean, again, you like people think, even with CrossFit, you don't have to be a crazy CrossFit athlete to, to better your life. Like you can go two or three times a week and, and still better your life. And you're not going to look like the women that are competing in the games. Yeah. And if that's not, if that's not what you want to look like, you don't have to worry about looking like that because you're not going to train hard enough. You're not going to eat the way that they eat to get to that level. Like mm -hmm. it's just not like, if that's not a goal of yours, you will not attain that. Um, looking at a weight does not make women bulky, right? It's just like yep. looking at a Corvette. doesn't make the Corvette go any faster. Mm -hmm. You have to get in and drive a Corvette. You have to get in and move the weight um, and you have to move enough weight to look like that. Um, and more often, like that's very hard to achieve. Men and women, it's very hard to achieve. So, yep. but you're training for a better life. Yeah, exactly. Whether it's at home or in the mountains. Yep. So preferably both, you know, life in the mountains. Right. Life. <laughs> That's not a bad life. No, I don't think so. Um, well, do you have anything else to, to add to put the cherry on top or anything? No, 
Um, if you, if anybody wants to get a hold of me, I'm on Instagram, Wilderness uh, Physical Therapy on Instagram. Uh, emails info at wildernesspt.com. I'm more than happy to answer anybody's questions. Um, I do Q and A's on Wednesdays too that you can submit questions to. So if you really don't want to reach out personally and you want to just submit a Q and A answer on Wednesdays, I do that too. Um, but I'm I'm just here to help. Awesome. All right. And uh, if uh, if someone does want to work with you, become an online patient of yours, they just they email you, or is there a form that they can fill out? They can go to the website. Uh, okay. It's wildernessphysicaltherapy.com. I'm pretty original with all my all my uh, stuff. And um, there, uh, there's an apply for coaching uh, segment, and you just fill out the the form. It takes less than three minutes, I think, to fill out. Um, and then get that filled out. I'll get back to you, and then we'll schedule a consult. Uh, make sure that what I do is what you want. Um, so that way you're not wasting your time and money. And then, um, yeah, we'll get, then we get started. Typically awesome. right now it's like, a, it's an eight week program, um, to get through the things that we need to get through. Um, and then if they want to continue, they can continue, but typically eight weeks is long enough to, to teach what we need to teach. Okay. And one more question. So going into that, what, who would you say is a good candidate for, your eight week program. If somebody's on the fence of like, well, I kind of have like, I think I have good control over, over my pelvic floor, but I, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I do qualify for this. Yeah. If you're, so if you're having pain with sex, um, leaking bowel or bladder, um, if you're leaking at all with coughing, laughing, sneezing, squatting, um, any sort of your exercise movements, um, or you have a feeling of heaviness in your pelvic floor, um, that's a good sign. Like I can help you out with that stuff. Okay, sweet. All right. Well, Rob, thank you so much for coming on. I, I learned so much um, and I'm going to be implementing into my own training. So yeah, thank you for taking the time to just share your knowledge with us to, to help us out and, yeah, y'all, if you have any questions, please uh, reach out to Rob. Again, his his IG handle is Wilderness PT. Um, yeah, and then go to his uh, his website. Yeah. Give him give him a chat. Give him a shout. I really forget. I have free resources free resources on my website too. So I have a pregnancy guide, pregnancy and exercise guide. So if you're a pregnant mom, um, first time, last time, third time, whatever it is. Uh, check it out. I've got some pretty good information. There's like, there's so much information to cover that it's hard to cover it all in 45 minutes or however long we've been talking, but yeah, yeah, for definitely. So, okay, there you go. Go to his, go to his, uh, website, get those free resources, check them out, send them messages, all of that thing, all of those things. Um, all right. Well, thank you. Great. Thanks for having me on Kim.